All right, awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm giving a bit of a, of a talk on hacking all, disclaimer, <laughs> the things for the price of a coffee. Luckily, the price of a coffee is very variable, and so uh, we can do quite a bit with the coffee price. Uh, but essentially, what I want to show you is that a lot of advanced hardware attacks are often not that advanced anymore, as they have been you know, a couple of years back. Quickly about me, uh, who am I? My name is Thomas Roth. I'm probably better known as Stack Smashing by now. Uh, I'm a hardware hacker. I have a small YouTube channel where I do a lot of you know, embedded security things. And I also, together with Live Overflow, we run a small training company called Hextree.io, where we try to teach people hardware security, reverse engineering, all that kind of fun stuff. If you want an invite, uh, we're still in closed beta, but I'm happy if you come up to me, give me your email address, I'll invite you. But what I want to talk about is um, how I got started. So the very first microcontroller that I ever used is an Atmega 8. And this was in roughly 2005. And you know, like back then, there was no Arduino. There was mostly not even USB programmers for these things. And so what I had to do in school with essentially zero budget, um, I had to solder my own programmer, which looked somewhat like this. So this was for the printer port on the computer, a couple of resistors. And that's how you could get started with, with programming microcontrollers uh, back then. And so a couple of years later, I got into you know, security. And what really enabled me was a very cheap device called the Bus Pirate that you probably know. And they also just released a new version, essentially. And what was really cool about the Bus Pirate is I had essentially zero budget to spend on anything security. And this thing cost like 30 bucks or so. And it would allow me to do amazing things. Like I've given black hat talks just with what I found with the Bus Pirate. Then, you know, like slowly you build up your, your repertoire. You get a Bus Blaster, which is like a nice JTAG adapter. Uh, then, you know, everyone makes fun of your cheap multimeter. And so you eventually buy, you know, that Fluke multimeter that you've been eyeing for, for years. Then you buy uh, an oscilloscope, fancy one, because, you know, uh, at least it was used, so the price was good. Eventually, you have your own box just with programmers for random chips. Um, then you buy a more advanced logic analyzer. You buy a hot air station. Um, then you make the big mistake of getting into fault injection. And so you buy a ton of FPGAs. You buy a chip whisperer. You buy a chip whisperer Husky, a chip whisperer Pro, which is awesome, right? Then turns out that nice oscilloscope you bought, there are better ones, so you buy a new oscilloscope. Um, yeah. <laughs> I wish it, it remained at two oscilloscopes, but yeah. Um. <laughs> then you want to do EMFI, and so you buy a chip shouter. Um, then you, you figure out, hey, I want to do side channels, and so you buy an SDR. You figure out that there are better SDRs, so you buy another SDR. Um, you need a lab power supply, so you buy a 15 kilo lab power supply. And after not having seen your desk for years, um, <laughs> you, you have this setup where it's like, this is a pretty hard barrier to entry. And so what I like to think is like, I wouldn't have gotten into IT security and hardware security the way I did if there wasn't super cheap stuff. If there wasn't this programming adapter, I would not have programmed my first microcontroller. If there was no bus pirate, I probably would have never you know, gotten into dumping flash, you know? all that kind of stuff. And so also me knowing that like, getting emails from a lot of students and so on, a big question for me with everything that I do nowadays with like fancy equipment is, how can I make what I do now accessible to 14 year old me, right? Because that's essentially my target audience in my head at least, because that's what I want to enable. Or how do I enable a student without any funding to do these cool fancy attacks that you, you know, see at Black Hat where they have a $15,000 glitching setup? How can I do it in my bedroom? And how can I make this available to anyone who just wants to try it out? And there are a ton of lo uh, cool low-cost tools out there. Uh, shout out to Joe Fitz, the Tie Guard, for example. You know, you can get a really nice soldering iron for 20 bucks now. You can get a super cheap logic analyzer, uh, flash dumpers, this and that. Um, but what about some of the other attacks that we see very, very commonly now, right? Um, so, for example, my personal specialty nowadays is voltage fault injection. So, what is voltage fault injection? Essentially, we take a chip, you know, and we power it, and then we essentially 
at just the right amount of time, we drop the power to the chip for just a couple of nanoseconds, right? So this has to be super precise. And using this, we can cause undefined behavior in the chip. And if we get lucky, we can actually define that behavior, right? And so maybe what happens is if we drop the power for, you know, two nanoseconds, maybe we corrupt the register, maybe we skip an instruction, uh, maybe we cause memory corruptions, and so on and so forth. And if we manage to do this, especially instruction skips, we can do a lot of very cool hacks um, that can recover a lot of money, that can steal a lot of money, and that are just overall a lot of fun. Uh, and so, for example, if you have you know, a basic bootloader where basically on boot the signature of your firmware gets checked, and if the signature is correct, your system boots. If we mess with the firmware with our nice you know, $10 flash adapter, then this check will suddenly fail, and our system will not boot. However, with fault injection, if we manage to hit just the right, amount of, uh, just the, the right spot in time, where this signature check is happening, and we manage to glitch this, we can skip the check and just boot the system with our modified firmware. Nice in theory, the problem is, as always, uh, in the details, because essentially we have a couple of parameters that we need, and those need to be super precise. We need a trigger event, so for example, you know, if we glitch a boot, we turn on the chip, that's our trigger, then we have to wait a very precise amount of time, then we need to pulse for a very precise amount of time um, because we are attempting to hit a single instruction. If our chip, our target, is running at 60 megahertz, we need to be 62 nanoseconds precise, roughly. If it's at 100 megahertz, we have to be 10 nanoseconds precise. So how do you achieve such timing? Um, pretty, pretty difficult, depending on, on what you use. Your first option is a microcontroller, right? You just take an Arduino, you wait for a pin to get high, you, you know, do sleep nanoseconds, 100, turn on the I.O. But the problem is, these I.O.s are not fast enough, right? Like they generally, microcontroller I.O.s are like maybe in the low megahertz. The loops that you use for triggering and waiting for a pin, they will have a lot of jithering, your glitch will less, get less precise, and so it's possible, but it's not great. And so what everyone does who actually does this is they use FPGAs, and FPGAs have a couple of big uh, disadvantages. They are very expensive, uh, generally, um, and they also are difficult to use. But essentially, any glitching tool that you can buy online right now uses an FPGA, no matter if it's, you know, risk your chip whisper or whatever. And they tend to be difficult to program because you need to learn a dedicated language. Uh, they are annoying to test because, you know, a test bench is I'm not big into testing, I like to try. The turnaround time is like 15 minutes if you recompile the, the bitstream, and they're expensive. And also, when I, when I started doing, like trying to make this more accessible, they were heavily affected by the chip shortage, so you simply couldn't get them. I built a glitch board with a very uh, cheap FPGA. I couldn't get it anywhere, right? Because, you know, a single piece costs like 60 bucks, and then all the advantage is gone. Luckily for, for me and for us, hopefully, um, this chip came out, the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now, the Raspberry Pi Pico is like a $1 microcontroller, um, and it's essentially just a Cortex-M0, runs at 125 megahertz, and when it was released, I had zero interest in it. I was like, why do we need another STM32-ish chip? However, the Pico has two great details that I love about it. And so the first one is it can be overclocked to up to 200 megahertz. And the second one is it has a feature called PIO or programmable IO. And programmable IO is like the cheat code for hardware hacking with the Pico essentially. Also, it just costs $4. So you can get it everywhere in the world. It's $4. Almost everyone will be able to afford it. Now, what's this PIO thing? PIO stands for Programmable I.O., and it's essentially a special state machine for I.O. operations. And so there's a, basically two small dedicated CPU cores that run a custom assembly language with which we can do system clock speed I.O. And so like we can do at 200 megahertz single cycle GPIO toggling. We can wait for uh, signals to go high, go low, and so on at 200 megahertz. And it's super easy to use. 
it's super cheap and super available. So essentially, the PIO cores run in parallel with the CPU, and we can use them to just do very, very high-speed I.O. things. I won't go into too much detail, but essentially each PIO peripheral has four state machines, and so we can actually run like everything we program four times in parallel. And it's trivial to write a very precise glitcher in PIO. And so, for example, what we can do is uh, this simple, don't worry about the assembly details, I just want to walk you through how simple it is. Um, this simple piece of code is a 5 nanosecond precise glitcher on a Raspberry Pi Pico for $4. Essentially, all we do is we fetch in the delay and the pulse length into two registers. Then we have a wait condition here. We first wait for pin 0 to be 0 and then for pin 0 to be 1. So we wait for a rising edge on a signal. Then we have a simple delay loop that just like jumps to itself and decrements a register. Then we enable whatever our glitch output is. We have a short glitch loop. And then we disable the pin again. That's it. Takes like 10 minutes to write. The first time it takes two hours because the documentation is really, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's something. Um, yeah. But then how do we control power? Because if you read a lot of the glitching papers, uh, you will see there's like, glitch amplifiers, this and that, and you know, a lot of them get pretty particular on how you control the glitch. The easiest way to do this is to just use a MOSFET. It's just an analog switch, essentially. What we do is we take a MOSFET, we connect the gate to the Raspberry Pi Pico, we connect the source to ground, and then the drain pin to whatever we want to glitch. Because essentially what we can do, instead of you know, controlling the power supply, we just short circuit the power supply to ground, which is not ideal for whatever is giving us the power, but it works. And we only do it for a couple of nanoseconds. So generally, we don't break things too badly. And so what we do is we connect our chippy up here. And then whenever we enable the I.O., we short circuit the power supply to ground. Then we turn the I.O. off again, and the chip is back to normal. And we can do it this super precisely with the Pico. And a MOSFET, you know, you can use essentially whatever MOSFET you want. Um, you can get the 70 cent Amazon MOSFET and channel, doesn't matter. And at $5, you have a 5 nanosecond precise glitcher. That's pretty cool. That's uh, pretty nice. But, you know, what can, we, uh, what can we attack with this, right? I mean, theory is nice, but what's, what can we do in the real life with this? Now, a great example uh, that a lot of people in the audience are also very familiar with that I can spot is uh, the STM32. The STM32 is like the most common microcontroller family in the world, essentially. And it has this feature called readout protection. And so the idea is that we have three levels. We have level zero, where you can fully debug the chip. We have level one, where we can still connect with the debugger, but we can only read out the RAM. We can't read out the flash. And then we have level two where debugging is completely disabled and you can't do anything essentially. The thing is, if you, if you check the values, when a certain OTP register is set to hex AA, we are in level zero. If it's in hex CC, we are in level two. If we manage to flip a single bit while it's set to CC, it will downgrade into what's called RDP1. Why is this important? Well, some people thought it was a brilliant idea to use an STM32 to store millions of dollars in the form of crypto on a small plastic device. <laughs> and if you open that device up, you know, you, uh, you see that all that's in there is an STM32. And that one stores, you know, potentially millions of dollars. And so we looked at this a couple of years ago in something called wallet fail, uh, where we glitched those. And then the guy over there, <laughs> Joe Grant, uh, actually um, used, uh, I guess, the same glitch to recover $2 million from a Bitcoin wallet. And I think you used pretty fancy equipment, not just $4, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but essentially, so how do we do this? Well, we essentially brute force the chip, right? Like we boot the chip, we try to glitch at a random delay with a random pulse length. We try to connect with the debugger. And then we do this again and again and again and again and again and again for a month, potentially. Um, the problem is here, we are right now at $5 of equipment, but we are missing a debugger. 
And debuggers, good debuggers, will run you a lot of money, potentially. Um, but luckily for us, some other people built a JTAG debug probe for the Raspberry Pi Pico. And the Raspberry Pi Pico has two cores. And so what if we just port this thing to the second core? Suddenly, we have you know, a $5, $5 nanosecond precise glitcher <laughs> with integrated debugger. And if you do this, you can actually hook this up pretty nicely. I built a, a small custom PCB. So this is me sitting back there uh, glitching in STM32. And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy. So why not just give this uh, a try? So I'm dumb enough to try to do a hardware demo on stage. <laughs> so <laughs> let's give it a try. So I've got this, this thing here. Um, if the jumper wire stayed in place, everything should work. If not, I would blame the jumper wires. And so I, I built a whole library around this, right? Oh, you can't see because I'm not mirroring. I apologize. Oops. Do you see the window? I can't see anything down there. Second question, do you see my mouse pointer? There it is. Oh, there's like half a second delay, crap. I'm gonna switch to mirroring for a second. This is not going anywhere otherwise. Okay, this is better. So essentially, um, I build a small, so there's a firmware running on there, and I build a small Python library that lets us, you know, configure different trigger types, the glitch output, and so on. I'll go through that in a bit. Um, the problem with this demo is it looks, if it works, it looks super fake, because it just immediately says success. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, hit me up afterwards, I'm happy to show this to you. <laughs> but essentially, um, I will try to connect to the chip using OpenOCD. I'm actually gonna restart this real quick, just in case. And you can see that this just terminated immediately. And so the chip is not debuggable, the debugger couldn't connect, error, okay. And so, now let's try to glitch this. Again, I have my delay here. I measured this before, I brute forced this before for weeks, and so I know the delay, I know the pulses that will work, and so hopefully if I hit play up here, yeah, there we go. In 0.8 seconds, <laughs> we got a success. And so what I can do is hopefully open OCD. Yeah, you can see now we actually get a, a chip. We can connect to it. Uh, let me zoom in here. And I can, you know, show you the RAM contents, which will not be particularly exciting because I don't have $2 million on STM32. <laughs> All right. Um, demo worked. <laughs> <laughs> but what else can we glitch with this? And it turns out that, like, I, the first thing I glitched with this was, was the Apple AirTags, uh, just because I, I thought it would be fun. And now it has become kind of a meme, right? Like people glitch everything with this. In fact, if you buy um, the mod chip for the Nintendo Switch, it's gonna be uh, a Pico, essentially. There are people who attacked ECUs using like the Renesas uh, ECU chips, Willem Melching attacked them using a Pico. And now you can actually buy like mod, like tuning kits that will glitch the, the car with a Pico. Leonard uh, glitched the Starlink terminals, and so on and so forth. And so it's, it's pretty cool that now we can, you know, a lot of people are using PIO for this. And I thought I would make it a bit easier, and so I designed uh, a small board I call the Faultier. Uh, Faultier, it's a terrible pun, is because it's a gem word for sloth. Um, but essentially, it's, it's a mix of firmware and hardware. You can run it without the hardware. You can just run it on a breadboard, as I've shown with like a MOSFET. Uh, it's a Python-based control library. It's fully open source as of after this talk, I will hit the publish button. Um, and you can use the dedicated PCB, it's gonna be open source, or you just breadboard it, but it allows you to essentially not have to write PIO and spend the hours reading the documentation. Um, so, yeah. It also has the integrated debug probe, five nanosecond precision, and it actually allows you to do ADC measurements. And so if you glitch, for example, the AirTag, you can actually do a power side channel to see where you glitch, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so essentially Pico is amazing for glitching. Now let me quickly stop mirroring here so I get my 
presenter view. <coughs> now let's talk about other cool hardware attacks that you know certain big companies claim are pretty difficult to do. Um, let's talk about BitLocker. So BitLocker is the Windows integrated full disk encryption. It enables itself nowadays, which you can tell by all the forum posts of people trying to figure out why they can't read the data from the laptop that died. And it's supposed, according to the documentation, protect against theft of your machine and so on and so forth. And if you read the documentation, it pretty clearly says BitLocker and TPM. BitLocker provides maximum protection when used with a trusted platform module. The thing is, if you run BitLocker with a TPM and you turn on your machine, it actually at no point until Windows has boot up will ask you for a password or anything. And it's full disk encryption. And so how does this, how does this work? How can this be secure if it unlocks it itself? And it turns out that the idea is that between your CPU and your TPM, which on a lot of business machines is a dedicated chip, there are also machines that have the TPM integrated and so on and so forth, lots of disclaimers here, this is how it works on a lot of machines. The communication between the TPM and the CPU is in clear text. And so we can just steal the key here, uh, right? Um, the communication for this is in a protocol called LPC, uh, low pin count bus. And LPC has like, you know, a clock signal and then a lot of data signals uh, attached to it, essentially bound to it. And the thing is, LPC and overall SPI in laptops tends to be pretty fast. And so, for example, on my machine, this runs at 25 megahertz. And so to sniff this decently, you need a 100 megahertz logic analyzer. And then, you know, it gets expensive again. And so if only we had something cheap that could do fast I.O. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I built a small PCB with a couple of Pogo pins on there, and you will see why those are there in a second. And the BitLocker documentation has this nice text that says, attacker with skill, which I'm going to take as a compliment, <laughs> and lengthy physical access. Targeted attack with plenty of time, the attacker opens the case, soldiers, and uses sophisticated hardware and software. <laughs> Sounds like me. Um, <laughs> so. Let's see, uh, so I have my iPhone here running a, a stopwatch and my ThinkPad X1 Carbon. And so I'm gonna open up the laptop. This is the hardest part, by the way, to film well, so. And then I plug this thing on there and I get a key. And that's actually my BitLocker key. And so it turns out that <laughs> A lot of laptops actually have these pins exposed very easily on the backside for debugging purposes. On this Lenovo one, there's one special thing. On production hardware, they don't give out the clock signal. And so you, you don't get it on there. You could just solder. But in this case, I just essentially emulate my own clock. I just wait for the first falling edge. Then I wait 20 nanoseconds, you know. Yeah. And so uh, $4, very sophisticated and lengthy access of 42 seconds. To be fair, they have a small disclaimer at the very bottom of the documentation. Um, for some systems, bypassing TPM only might require opening the case and require soldering, but can be done for reasonable cost. I think this is pretty reasonable, so yeah. <laughs> cool, so another supposedly advanced attack done for the price of you know, uh, a cappuccino. Um, now let's talk about actually let's talk about the iPhone itself. Give me one second, because we have more time than I thought. Um, let's talk about the iPhone, the old one. So the old iPhone had this proprietary connector uh, called Lightning, and you know Lightning does a lot of obvious stuff like charging, USB, video, audio, whatever. But well, there's also cool stuff hidden behind it, and so it turns out that um, you can do JTAG um, and UART via via Lightning. And the thing is, I have a lot of friends who do iPhone security research. I personally don't really. And they, the only chance to get these cables that do JTAG, UART, and so on is either on the black market, which they don't give you an invoice for the university, or um, a device that costs $800 and is awesome, but unfortunately has not been available for the past five years. 
And the thing is, all this is done, like all these, this protocol negotiation and so on, is done via a simple one-wire protocol. And so, you know, <laughs> should be easy to do. And so we built um, what we call the Tamarin cable. So all these cables are named after monkeys. And so like Bonobo cable, Kong cable, and we choose the one that looks the coolest. So we call it Tamarin cable. It's essentially just a Pico hooked up to a lightning extension cable and you have an $800 uh, JTAG cable. Unfortunately, Apple decided that they want to get rid of Lightning, and so you know we essentially built the same for the iPhone 15 with USB-C. And again, this is based on somebody else's work. I don't want to claim like that I, I did all of this. Like there's a lot of people who started using the Pico to build really cool stuff, really accessible stuff for very cheap. And so, yeah, essentially we can use the Pico to JTAG the old iPhone, the new iPhone, to glitch things, and so on and so forth. Pretty advanced stuff, I think, that we can do for very cheap now. So let's talk about EMFI, electromagnetic fault injection. So, um, so far we looked at a lot of attacks that tend to be pretty cheap if you, you know, it's reasonable cost, like under $1,000, even if you buy tools for it. Um, in the new MacBooks, there's a chip called the ACE3, and this ACE3 is essentially the Type-C port controller. So it sits between the USB-C port and the system on, on the chip. And it obviously does USB, but it also has a lot of hidden functionality. And so, for example, you can get a serial console, you can get JTAG, you can access something called SPMI and so on. Gave a whole talk about this, doesn't matter too much here. But the thing is that the ACE2 used on previous um, MacBooks used to be debuggable, you could dump it, you can find out all the secrets by just reversing it. It's all pretty simple. On the new MacBooks, however, uh, we have a couple of these new ACE3 chips. And if we zoom in on them, I hope you can see this. Um, we have the ACE3 here in the middle. We have a spy flash and we have a couple of debug connectors. Now, the problem is, previously, you could you know, just solder on some wires here and you could debug this chip. It was just a rebranded Texas Instruments chip. It was actually very easy to do. Um, and it would load some patches from Flash and so on. Unfortunately, with the ACE3, it's completely custom. It's a completely undocumented chip. There's no firmware, no debugging enabled, some kind of secure boot, because even if we try to fuck with the Flash, it like doesn't boot anymore. So they do something right here. And so what if we just use fault injection to, you know, try to, to read this chip out? Now, I should mention I bought this laptop privately as a hobby. So it's like 3K. And if I do voltage fault injection, it will require soldering in a 3K device. I'm probably going to break it. Yeah, it doesn't sound great. But there's a cool alternative approach called electromagnetic fault injection. And so essentially what you do is you create a high voltage pulse into a coil, it dissipates into the chip, and then you do like voltage fault injection, but very localized in the chip. Probably physically the wrong explanation, but that's how I visualize it. And again, this allows us to skip instructions, change register values, and so on. So essentially we take you know, an EMFI device, we uh, point it at a chip, we zap it, and the chip is hacked. But we need timing. And so the problem is, how do you get timing on a chip that you know nothing about, right? Like the only thing we have is the contents of the external flash. And as soon as we modify them, the chip stops booting. Side channels. So essentially what we can do is we can measure when in time the chip stops booting, right? Because if you think about it, if we have the original firmware on there, power consumption will look, you know, one way. If we mess with it, eventually the, uh, the traces will diverge and that's where the boot fails and where we can potentially glitch. Normally you would use an expensive oscilloscope for this and like a, a nice near field probe. I used a, a Hacker F1, um, which is you know not four dollars, but you've got to be flexible. And instead of a near field probe, I just use a very cheap, um, a cheap coil because near field probes can easily run you hundreds of dollars just for this. Set this all up. The reason for the HackRF instead of an RTL SDR is, by the way, that the HackRF supports a hardware trigger, and so I can easier uh, start recording on it. And then I just drop this without any precision on the chip, and we capture the magic chip waves. And when we actually restart the chip, we can actually see activity in the spectrum here. And so we measure something. We don't know if it's anything useful, but we measure something. 
And when I looked at the contents of the external flush, I saw that there are a couple of CRCs. And the thing about CRCs is there's an outer CRC for the overall firmware, then there's a detailed CRC for some part of the firmware, and so on. And so my idea was I flashed the original firmware unmodified. I collect the trace. There's a lot of signal processing between this. I published the Jupyter notebook for it. Doesn't matter. It's just FFT essentially. Um, and when I when I change the outer CSC of the flash, you can see that it looks very different, right? Where you have a very a, a huge difference in how the boot looks. And then um, we have a second CRC, and unfortunately, if we correct this one or make it wrong, there's not really a difference. However, with the third CRC that I found, we can pretty much precisely see that the, the boot continues normally. And then over here, it kind of looks different. And so my idea was I will just, you know, point the zapper at this point in time and see what's going on. So I built this setup with uh, pretty expensive equipment. By the way, this is just for the photo op. The reality looked uh, like this. <laughs> so, and then I, I gave this a try. And so I let this run for, uh, you know, a couple of hours. And uh, it turns out that this chip is also responsible for charging. And so if you reboot it and it can't boot, um, the ACE will completely stop responding. You need to reboot. But then your laptop doesn't charge anymore, so you have like eight hours, and then you have to restore the firmware, charge it up, start over, and so on and so forth. But eventually, um, it worked. We got it glitched. Um, the problem is with like 5K of equipment, right? We have the chip shouter, this, that, X, Y, Z. But luckily, Colin O'Flynn, the creator of the chip shouter, decided to compromise his own business by creating the Pico EMP, which is a Pico-based EMFI tool for, you know, roughly 30 bucks. And so, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, but that's still $150, and the title of the talk is, this is all for the price of a cappuccino. Turns out, if you order a flat white with 170 extra shots, <laughs> And coconut milk. <laughs> you end up with exactly $150. And so I'm technically correct, which I think is the best kind of correct. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to tell you is advanced hardware attacks are getting more accessible, and which hopefully means that soon they won't be considered advanced, which I think is awesome. And just because something is, was considered difficult when something was built and the documentation says, oh, only experts can do this, doesn't mean it's still true. And fault injection is freaking awesome and you should try it. Um, I have a couple of hardware kits with me. So if you see me walking around, like maybe starting this afternoon, uh, I'm happy to sh you know, give you the ability to glitch your first chip. If this was too long for you, this essentially covers the whole talk. So, yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> Any questions? Security is always a cat and mouse game. What are they going to do to make this harder for you in the future? I don't know, I'm the cat. <laughs> No, uh, basically they, they are introducing chips that have like active glitch monitors and so on and so forth, but they are still, a lot of chips are still glitchable. And you know, like Apple, the, the chip we just glitched, they have a big, you know, a big office in Paris where they do all this kind of attack, but yeah, sometimes you, you just get lucky. Cool. More questions? Otherwise, no? Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Um, all right, we'll be back in about 10 minutes for our next talk.